using the electron microscope, how easy is it for you to differentiate between all these retroviruses? Because they all look, to someone like me, the untrained eye, they, they all look the same. Uh, certainly not. I will be able to teach you within half, half an hour. <laughs> we have made a nice summary on, on these structural differences. You can measure. And if you start measuring the ribonucleoprotein, that's a complex of the genome and some protein, where is it in the virion, in the budding, in the immature particle? How is that organized in the mature particle? versus the immature particle. What about the glycoprotein knobs? These are questions that can be quantitatively assessed. So you really can make an objective diagnosis. So for someone like you, it's easy to tell the difference? Yes. Yeah. So the, the cone-shaped core yeah. is um, very identifiable. It looks very different than a C-type, is that right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. <clears throat> Okay, or at least to the trained eye. No, no, <coughs> you will see it. Oh, okay. <laughs> How come, in your opinion, did Gallo and Montagnier see C-type instead of Lenti when they looked in under their electron microscopes? Because they uh, had it in the brain. Oh, they saw what they wanted to see? Yeah. No. Oh. Still, the purification is the biggest problem, the purification. Once, if you don't have purified, if you have no good purification, as Montagnier said, if you have no good, you got to have purification to be able to characterize the virus. Even if, we had, if one assumes that Montagnier and Gallo and the particles are retroviral particles, the reverse transcriptase is uh, specific to retroviruses, to say that you have a unique retrovirus, you must characterize, you must, its proteins and its RNA. You must show that these have proteins and RNA which is not present in other retroviruses. And why in your mind is there such uh, inconsistencies in identifying the virus among the experts? Uh, the particles? Yes. I don't know. We cannot say that you have a new retrovirus unless you show that it has unique, partic unique proteins and unique RNA. And to show that, you must purify the virus. There is no other way. If you say that these proteins and this RNA are HIV RNA and HIV protein, you must somehow obtain them from the virus particles. But because the viral particles are so small, the next best thing is to obtain them from a mass of material which contain nothing else but retrovirus particles. Well, when I talked to Flossie Wongstall, she said that you don't necessarily have to take pictures. You can go to the culture and look for viruses budding as evidence of release of virus. Yes. As I said to you, budding and retrovirus-like particles, just seeing them in the culture, there is no proof that they are retrovirus. That is no evidence. Take pictures from the culture. It's no proof that they are virus. And certainly, you cannot prove just looking at that. Uh, there are so many things there in the culture which also contain proteins, which also contain RNA, and contain DNA. To say that HIV has nine proteins, and HIV has a genome, a unique genome, nine uh, genes, you must take you must have evidence that these proteins originated from the viral particles. And to do that, you must take these particles out from the culture. You got to have them out. You, you must purify them. You must obtain them separate from everything else which contains proteins. She said that there were problems that when you spin the particles under the high-speed centrifuge, yes that they often distort, or they lose their envelope, or they break apart. And that's why it's, it's almost impossible to purify viruses. No, there are many, many pictures of uh, electromicrographs of retroviruses which have been purified. You know, I can show you, including this one, a Russercoma virus. When you take somebody to, to court for a paternity 
soot, mm -hmm. you must have evidence that the blood originated from the father and from the child. Mm -hmm. There is no other way. You must have proved that they originated from the father and from the child to compare the DNA. The same way, if you want to say that these proteins are from HIV, you must have them coming from HIV. But the particles are too small, so the best next thing is to purify viruses. And this is not me who says it. I mean, this is all the trovorologists, including uh, Montagnier, including Charmaine, including Barres and Ussi. That is, you know, this is so simple. So you must have purification. That is the only way. You see, this is what the HIV. Retroviruses have the matter of 100 to 120 nanometers. They have a cone-shaped core. They have the lateral bodies, and they have knobs. What are the knobs? When we see uh, HIV being diagrammatically represented, you see there, there are some spikes coming out from the particle. And these knobs are extremely important for effectivity. Again, according to all the HIV experts, if you ha the knobs are crucial. They are essential for infection. No knobs, no infection. And there is no infection, the particles cannot be viruses. So a complex process of an interaction of the outer protein of the virus called the envelope with molecules on the surface of the cell are essential for a virus to enter the cell. And when we speak of entry, we essentially mean the guts or the internal component of the virus that contains its genetic information in the form of RNA and certain other proteins. Today, nobody has proven the existence of knobs in the cell free particles. Obviously, when we first uh, uh, were working on the cause of, of AIDS, we had to be very broadly, uh, have our ability to include a whole variety of different potential organs, organisms that could cause it. What was helpful um, in the, in the limiting of, of our search uh, were the cases in hemophiliacs where the material that's used to treat hemophilia comes from blood of, of, uh, or plasma, a subcomponent of blood that is sold or donated into the system and then a purification process is, is used to take that large volume of plasma and specifically pull out the anti um, hemophiliac factors that actually can treat the hemophiliacs. Now in that process, the, the, the one thing you want to, uh, you have to realize is that material is given intravenously to uh, the hemophiliacs to treat them and you have to have it very clean. You don't want to have any infectious agents in that if you can avoid it. And one of the easiest ways to do any of uh, preparation of a drug is to filter it. Now we have these wonderful modern filters where you can work on your, your drug and then the last, the last step before you put it in the bottle, pass it through a filter that filters out all infectious agents. Now I say all, uh, meaning that the filter can only filter out those that the filter can catch, which is the bigger agents. That bacteria um, and parasites are much bigger than viruses. And those filters indeed will filter out all the bacteria and make it, quote, sterile. That is, you cannot grow bacteria from it. Uh, so, but yet we knew that after this process that they were still getting this disease um, which could have been caused by a virus, a bacteria, or a parasitic disease, or whatever. But since all of the larger bacteria and parasites are eliminated in these filters, then you can assume that the disease uh, that you're looking at is caused by a virus. And does it also filter out the infected cells, so is it just pure free-floating HIV virus? The, the factor eight material is cell free, so it's a, the only liquid material, and that that liquid material would can, could contain many infectious agents from the donors of all these. Literally, there's hundreds of, of donors in each of these batches, um, and 
when you filter it out, you filter out all the bigger organisms, that is, bacteria and parasites. You're only left with viruses that go through the filter. I reckoned that a virus that would survive the purification of clotting factors from human blood uh, was more likely to be a virus without a cell membrane, a small virus like a parvovirus, and uh, I would not have put a retrovirus at the top of the list. And yet, when HIV was discovered, uh, it was indeed a retrovirus. I think my scientific reasoning was perfectly correct, um, but uh, uh, I was deluding myself nonetheless. Is there something harsh about the factor process? Could... Well, I didn't realize how unharsh uh, the purification of clotting factors is. We were talking about purification. Those clotting factors are anything but pure and they were tainted with this virus. They were tainted with hepatitis B virus, with hepatitis C virus, which also was not discovered until long after HIV was discovered. So uh, HIV was just one of several viruses that was passed in clotting factors. Now here it is a paper which was published by several authors uh, which, uh, uh, with a co-author, Geldenblum, and they say, they have found that on the average, after, immediately after release, after the knobs are released, the particles into the fluid, there are 0.5 knobs per particle. And they said even these 0.5 knobs, they may be false positive. That is, there are no knobs at all. The knobs here look like little knobs everywhere. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Okay. There's a chance that you have some dirt, of course, in the cell culture. And these would be knobs from a particle that is cut tangentially. Here the same. That's my interpretation. So my interpretation. But here are the knobs. Here might be some, there might be some dirt here, sure, that is dirt from preparation. Mm -hmm. But aren't, don't these look like knobs too, coming off of this big one? Yeah, you know, they are glycoproteins also on the cell. Okay. Yeah. Now, we have to differentiate between them. If we would like to go for differentiation, we have to use immuno-electron microscopy to make a tag. It's either the glycoprotein or it's something different. <coughs> in, in a paper published in, in 2003, the author state, the cost of GP180, that is the knobs, do not form spikes on the surface of HIV as is commonly described in the literature. We suggest the spike snob observed by negative staining electron microscopy may be an artifact of the penetration of heavy metal stains between the envelope proteins. What exactly does that mean? That means that well, despite some people claims that there are knobs on the HIV particles, these authors say that the particles have no knobs, in plain language. This is a paper published 2006 in Nature. Here it is sieve, semen immunodeficiency virus. And in these particles, you can see many knobs. But when you come to the electron micrograph on, of what is meant to be HIV particles, there are hardly any Knobs. In fact, we can see only one there, but you can see the same thing down there. And you don't know if there are knobs or there is some artifact there. In fact, the authors call them putative. Putative knobs. Or putative means supposed, supposedly HIV knobs. Mm -hmm. So the authors do not have, even today, proof that the HIV particles have 
knobs which are crucial for infection. Even if we admit, you know, even if we accept that there are knobs, there are 0.5 knobs immediately per particle on the average, immediately after they are released, they are lost. Even this small number is lost very rapidly, according to Geldenblum. And these knobs being lost so rapidly, and, H, and in fact, I ate preparation taking a long time from the time it is the blood is taken to the time the fact I ate is prepared is a long time. And even after it is prepared, it may stay on the bench for months before it is used. So it is impossible for hemophiliacs. The, the fact I ate to contain an infectious HIV particle, even if HIV exists. I wanted to ask you about hemophiliacs. Because they had cell-free uh, plasma, it was just the virus. But the virus sheds its membranes within 24 hours. So how, one thing we can go is, how is it able to actually infect the T cells? Yes, it's a question, but uh, uh, we have to know that uh, all the fraction of the blood could be infectious. And there is some virus bound to red blood cells which could be released also in, in the plasma after uh, treatment or incubation. Some virus is bound to red cells also as well. Uh, so uh, perhaps there are more virus, when you process the blood, more virus could come in the plasma, okay? And this virus could be protected by the plasma proteins from denaturation. This is one, uh, one thing possible, one possible thing. The other is the quality of the host. Uh, hemophiliacs are fragile. Being transfused many times, their immune system also is uh, depressed before they get infected with HIV. So they are prone to HIV infection because of their immune system uh, weakness, okay? So combining this with the fact that the virus could exist also in forms, which are studying now, which probably are more resistant than uh, we think for the usual particles, could explain. The little ones. Yes, little ones or the bound to plas macroplasma proteins, you know, that's uh, possible that back Macroplasma are more resistant, perhaps. Macroplasma envelope could be more resistant than the viral envelope. Okay. The, is but there are all, all hypotheses. I'm not. Uh, this is not based on solid data, of course. This is just assumption. They are just assumption. But to, you are right. This is. An, uh, we have to explain why hemophiliacs have been so easily infected with uh, plasma products. For you, the entire existence of HIV rests upon the fact that there are no pictures of the purified gradient. Is that correct? It is part of it. That is the most crucial evidence which you need. If there you don't have these pictures, which prove that the, there are, in the purified virus, there are, the, what they call purified virus, there are virus-like particles, then the whole experiment, and thus the existence of HIV, it's finished. And you're saying to date there is no pictures of purified virus? To date there is no pictures of purified virus. And certainly Montagnier did not publish it, Gallo did not publish it, Levy did not publish such pictures, Weiss did not publish such pictures. Um, and the only pictures which have been published was in, in fact, this is admitted by the Franco-German researchers in, in 1997, when the first attempts, uh, the first pictures of what is called purified HIV were published by two groups, one from the United States and one fr in a Franco-German study. You said that in 1997 they did try to purify HIV, is that correct? Yes. And you're saying they weren't successful? They're not successful. You know, what, what is more important, this authors, they, they uh, accepted or they admitted, but by 1997, there is no evidence for purification. And here it is. This is from the Franco-German study. Virus to be used for biochemical and serological analysis 
or as an immunogen, that is as an antigen, is frequently prepared by centrifugation through sucrose gradients. And they said, in none of these studies has the purity of the virus preparation been verified. So by 1997, there is no proof that HIV has been purified. But did they purify HIV? They tried. So they accepted this. As I said, we've been asking this for the very beginning to have some evidence for HIV purification. And these authors tried to present, or they did their best to purify HIV. And here is their evidence. This is the Franco-German study. And they had material which is meant to represent purified HIV. The top and the middle is obtained, is material obtained from infected cultures. And it's meant to represent uh, purified HIV. The bottom part is material obtained in the similar manner from non-infected cultures. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the arrows, they said, represent the HIV particles. First of all, this cannot be said to be purified virus. As you can see, they are not purified particles. In fact, only the, the particles which they, they put the arrows are said to be particles which look like HIV. The rest are all cellular fragments or called mm, vesicles. In, the, in uh, the, the material which is obtained from the non-infected cultures, you can see even there, there are some particles which may look like the one which has eroded. So it is significant, significant that the authors do not call this material purified HIV. In fact, they call it purified vesicles from infected H9 cells, the top, and activated cells. So the authors admit that this cannot be considered purified HIV. With all the effort they, they put, they could not obtain purified HIV. Okay. It is also important that the, the, the particles which are Aeroid as representing HIV, they don't have all the morphological characteristic attributed to HIV. They, there is no evidence for knobs. In fact, even their diameter is uh, uh, higher than what is considered to be the, the retroviral particles. But does size really matter? I mean, humans vary in sizes. They matter because oh, the, 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 this, in, in the Franco-German, is the size is, they are larger, but not as large as in the, in the American uh, evidence for purification. Here is the effort by the American researchers in purifying HIV. These are their results. And as you can see, they did not, they were not able to obtain purified HIV. And again, the particles which are uh, eroded and are said to represent HIV, mm -hmm. they do not have all the morphological characteristic attributed to lentiviruses. And in fact, they don't have the knobs, they don't have uh, cone-shaped core, you cannot see there, they don't have lateral bodies, which are, uh, they should be in HIV, and most importantly, their diameter is too, they are too large. The average diameter of the, of the, uh, of the particle is 220, 234. And none has a diameter less than 160. Just by taking their diameter, it is impossible the, the, particles which are labeled as HIV to be HIV. Is the size also important in determining what you're looking at? 
Yeah, <coughs> think about uh, viruses can be as big as a pox viruses, up to 300 nanometer, HIV up to 150. The smallest autonomously drawing virus will be a circa virus, just 15. Oh, wow. Nanometer. So what's the smallest HIV particle that's ever been documented? Uh, I think it's, it's something, one, 120 to 150. No, these are fixed morphological entities. They don't change. They don't change. Hmm? So that's, that's a huge thing in helping you differentiate whether it's HIV or yeah, not. Yeah, the size of a structure is very important to make the diagnosis. Now, if the particles which are labeled by Bess and his colleagues as being HIV, then the, the absolutely necessary condition is for the material which was obtained from, uh, from the infected cultures to have proteins which are not present in the material which was obtained from non-infected cultures. Right. Is yeah. this... But this does not seem to be the case, and in fact, Bess and his colleagues have come with this evidence. They took the proteins from all the three bands they had, from the two infected cultures, or the, what they called infected cultures, and from the non-infected cultures. And here are the proteins from the non-infected cultures, which they are put in a strip. Here are the proteins from the two infected cultures. As you can see, if you look at this, oh, there is a difference, but the difference between the, the strips is only quantitative. That is, we have these bands in all the strips, mm -hmm. only there is less here. Similarly with all the other proteins, in some of them, in fact, they are exactly the same. So by looking at these pictures, the proteins which existed in the purified material, the HIV purified material, any of the material which was obtained from the non-infected cultures contained the same proteins, which means that none of these uh, cultures contained HIV. As I said, if the cultures which contain, they say, contain HIV, they should, must have had proteins which are not present in the non-infected cultures. And yet, this is not the case. The proteins, all the proteins are found, which are found in the infected, the so-called infected cultures, they are also found in the non-infected cultures. Some of them in smaller quantities, but nonetheless, they are there. The difference may be just because the way the cultures were conducted. The American authors labeled the, some of the proteins. And the, the P6, P7, P17, and P24 are labeled as HIV proteins. And these two proteins, that is, proteins which are around 32 and around 41, they were labeled as cellular proteins. No label is put in the proteins which had molecular weight higher than 41. Yet there are many HIV proteins which have molecular weight. Now, why they didn't label them? First, all the proteins which are around 41 and 32 are non-HIV. They cannot be HIV proteins with molecular weight 41 or around 41, a molecular weight of 32 or around 32. Okay. We ask best why they labeled uh, these other three proteins as HIV. And he said that they put this label because that's what the reviewer asked them. But they did not have evidence themselves that they were HIV proteins. He stated that they did not have evidence that they were HIV proteins? Yes, he stated that they did not obtain themselves, but the reviewer asked them to label them as HIV proteins. And he said the reviewer was right. We label them HIV. Did he specifically state they had no evidence those were HIV proteins? Personally, they did not have evidence. Yes. Best said that? Yes. 
In this, in this experiment, they did not obtain evidence. In this experiment, they did not obtain evidence that these proteins were HIV. But they labeled them HIV because the reviewer asked them. So the question is why they didn't label mm -hmm. the proteins higher than 41. Mm -hmm. Well, there, must, there are some good reasons for it. First of all, many HIV experts, not, maybe not all of them, but many HIV experts, accept that the protein of 120 and 160 are polymers of P41. That is, they are 41 joined together. Three 41 are joined together and are made 120. Four 41 are joined together and are make 160. They admit all the proteins above, above 24. There is evidence that the protein above 24,000 molecular weight are cellular proteins. And they also know that the proteins, well, is molecular weight lower than uh, the P17, P6, uh, P7, they are subunits of proteins with a high molecular weight. So now we are left with one protein, P24. We come back. Now, what is 24? Well, to answer that question, we have to, to go to an interview which Montagnier gave to the uh, French uh, investigative journalist Jamel Tahi. Jamel Tahi asked Montagnier why they didn't publish any electron micrographs of the material which they said represented purified virus. And Montagnier responded, we found some particles, but they did not have the morphology typical of retroviruses. Jamel Tahi insisted to, uh, to find why, how it was possible that they did not publish when they claimed that they have purified it. Mm -hmm. And then his, and they, in the purified virus, they did not have typical, even, even retrovirus-like particles, much less HIV and much less purified. Montagnier repeated, I repeat, we did not purify it. Then he was asked if Gallo purified it. And Montagnier responded, I do not know if he, Gallo, really purified. I don't believe so. Jamel Tehi asked Montagnier, do M picture from the purif for, for purification exist? Montagnier responded, yes, of course. Have they been published? Montagnier, I could not tell you. We have some somewhere, but it's not of interest, not of any interest. Of, for us, it's of very great interest. It's crucial. Mm -hmm. If you don't have them, then there's no way you can prove the existence of HIV. Mm -hmm. and then we asked Gallo. Montagnier subsequently published many pictures of purified HIV particles, as, of course, we did in our first paper. You have no need to worry. The evidence is obvious and overwhelming. Or there was no pictures of purified virus in Montagnier's, in Gallo's uh, 1984 papers or of any other of Gallo's publications. Going back to 1983, when trying to prove the existence of a new virus, why was purification important? It was important to, pre to prepare uh, uh, kits for antibody detection. Okay, because we wanted this uh, uh, diagnosis kits to be as specific as possible. Okay. Okay. If you use a preparation with a virus which is not purified, of course you uh, will detect antibody to everything, not only against to the virus, but also against all the proteins that are produced in the supernatant. Okay. 
Now, these, all these pictures here, yeah. are these all from culture? Yeah. All from culture. Do, I, you, do you have any from the gradient? Yeah. There's 80% of dirt. Oh, 80% of dirt. Yeah. Oh. And therefore, I didn't like that. But it was necessary for also for us to control because this house in 85 already established ELISA anti-gene material for testing people. There oh. was nothing commercially available, but we had to purify. We had to look at the material that was used for the ELISA. 80% dirt. Okay. Okay. That's the truth. Again, Jamel Tahi interviewed uh, Charles Doger, which was the electron microscopist at the Pasteur Institute. And he, in his response, he said, what in the purified virus, they had only cellular debris. They never had virus. Which means, that the P24 protein originated from a material which contained not even retrovirus particles, much less purified virus. So in 2001, the EM specialist from Pasteur admitted they never saw anything? Yes. Yes, he admitted that they never saw any virus-like particles, much less purified virus. In fact, what they had there was cellular debris all the way long. Well, what's the purpose of the purification then? Well, to, uh, to make sure uh, uh, you have a, a real virus, uh, you know. The P24 originated from a material which did not even have virus-like particles, much less purified virus. So it's cellular debris? We, yes, had only cellular debris, which means you cannot have a better evidence that P24 is a cellular protein, cannot be HIV. If it originated from a material that contains only cellular fragments, it has to be a cellular protein. Now, even if we assume that P24 is an HIV protein and that Montagnier discovered the first one protein virus, this creates even a bigger problem. This is because retroviruses have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, which is a protein. That's why they are called retroviruses. Their name derives from this protein. If they don't have this protein, if they don't have this enzyme, the virus cannot be a retrovirus. That will be like having an object which does not have any wings and yet you still call it an aeroplane. Now, we know that in his experiments, Montagnier found reverse transcriptase activity. And on the basis of this activity, he claimed to have proven infection of brew and his cell cultures with HIV, as well as detection, transmission, and isolation of HIV. Since P24 is not a reverse transcriptase protein, as you can see from the picture, it means that all Montagnier did was prove what they all knew all along. Reverse transcriptase activity is not specific to retroviruses. Under the right conditions, it can be detected in all cells infected with a retrovirus or non-infected with a retrovirus. If there are no HIV proteins, there can be no HIV genome. What Montagnier and Gallo call the HIV genome is nothing more than a form of RNA known as adenine-rich RNA, 
which they found at the 1.16 gram per mil band, among other RNAs and DNAs, despite the fact that Gallo never published proof that the band contained retrovirus particle, and Montagné admitted it did not have any, they called this RNA HIV RNA. It's even worse. Gallo knew as far back as 1972 that rich RNA is not specific to retroviruses. This type of RNA can be found in any cells which are synthesizing proteins. In any case, the existence of HIV and even its causative role in AIDS were both accepted well before any genomic studies were published. Today, we have not yet proof for the existence of any of the HIV proteins. And if you don't have proof for the existence of viral proteins, you cannot have proof for the existence of the virus. Well, what's the purpose of the purification then? Well, to, uh, to make sure uh, uh, you have a, a real virus, uh, you know. Uh, How come you guys didn't just show pictures from the gradient? We, we, we first show it from the culture. By, just by centrifugation, you know, but not sequence gradient. From the pictures alone, though, in culture, you can't prove what virus you found yet. Of course, electron microscopy is not sufficient to, to prove you have a retrovirus, that's clear. You need uh, other characteristics like the density. The reverse transcriptase activity is the key. We did describe the electron microscopy as a proof. Mm -hmm. We described the reverse transcriptase activity as a proof it was a retroviral. No, reverse transcription is actually very widespread. Something like 50% of the DNA in our cells comes about by reverse transcription. When I said 50%, I'm saying 50% of the DNA came about by reverse transcription. But it's not all retroviruses. The problem is that they detected non they didn't they detected non specific phenomena. Reverse transcription, particles, and we've seen all the problems with particles, and antigen antibody reactions. And so you can't take a whole lot of things that might be something and turn them into that something. That's the problem. You, if, I mean if you're walking down the if you walk into a an empty space and you find an engine block and a, a fan belt and a and a generator lying on the ground, what do you say you've got? Do you know what you've got? I mean, is that, a, is, that a, is that a car? Is, could it be a boat? Could it be a plane? Could it be something someone uses on a farm to lift grain up? Could be all those things. You can't, you, you can't make something specific out of a whole lot of things that are non-specific. So they didn't, they used a whole lot of non-specific and just preferred to believe that this is what they'd found. What Montagnier did is similar to a fisherman throwing his net into the ocean, pulling it back, looks at it, finds no fish, and yet he claims that not only that he has fish, but he has nothing else but fish and all of the same kind, HIV.